And we are live. Sorry, friends. We're a few minutes late, but hey, we're rolling with it. And we're so excited to be here with you now. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am delighted to present to you number one New York Times bestselling author, Jacqueline Machard, here to give us the inside scoop on her brand new book, The Good Son, out now. Jacqueline, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. Well, it's both of those things. It's a mystery and a thriller. It, uh, and also a sort of meditation on what we're responsible for when our children do wrong. Ooh, well, there is a lot to talk about this book. And I can't wait to get into every single detail of it because we've got a lot of meat to dive into. But first, I just want to welcome everyone who's watching with us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Murder by the Books channels, my channels, Mystery and Thriller Mavis, the private Facebook group tonight, Bitchy Bookworms joining us as well. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited for you to have the chance to talk to Jacqueline, to ask her anything about the good son. So if you've been here before, you know how this works. And if you're new, welcome. Here's how it works. Every Monday for hashtag mystery Monday, because you know, Mondays can be murder. I give you my featured handpicked authors and you get to ask them anything. So ask Jacqueline about her writing, about her books, about the story, about a mother trying to reckon with her son recently discharged from prison, convicted of killing his girlfriend at the age of 17, a crime he does not remember. Also reckoning with her former best friend, the girl's mother, Belinda's mom. So much to talk about. Um, so if you have any questions about any of that, and I know I have a lot of questions, just get them going in the comments and I'll get them right over to Jacqueline. Leecha is saying, hi, Sarah and Jackie from Texas. Leecha, welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you. Anissa Joy, welcome. She says, hello, Sarah and Jacqueline. I am here for it. Anissa does a ton with Friends in Fiction. She does Facebook Lives with Jenna Bush Hagar. She is a huge bookstagrammer doing a lot of cool things. Leecha would like to know, let's get right into the questions. What inspired you to write The Good Son? I, uh, I met a woman in a coffee line at a writer's conference. She dropped her book on the ground and I picked it up and handed it to her. And I said, oh, are you here for the book for the writer's conference? And she said, no, I'm here to see my son. He's in prison and he'll be in prison for a long time. He was only her son was only 19 and he had been convicted of killing his beloved. They had been sweethearts since they were seven, in the seventh grade. And he had no memory. He had been so messed up on drugs. He had no memory of the crime taking place at all. And <clears throat> when I, I, they were introducing me from the stage when I finally finished when I finally, I couldn't turn away from the woman. I sat down with her and we talked for a long time. And she also told me there's a scene that's kind of like this in the book that was suggested by that, in which she goes to the cemetery. Thea, the mother of the uh, accused boy, goes to the cemetery to put roses on the girl's grave. And the mother shows up, the girl's mother shows up. And She's terrified and wonders what's going to happen. They had been neighbors and known each other well before that. And they ended up just crying in each other's arms. And the, the mother of the girl said, you're luckier because at least you can still touch him. And so this story stayed with me for years. And when I told my agent I wanted to write about it, he said, in a word, no, <laughs> because it's just, you could never make these people sympathetic. You could never make them someone with whom people could identify. And I was shocked by that because I could already identify with them. Right. Jacqueline, when was this? How long ago was it? This was, um, maybe it was eight, seven or eight years ago, something like that. And I thought about it for that length of time. And I had had two other book ideas that on, in unprecedented ways in my, this had never happened to me before. They just didn't work out. And when I decided that I wanted to write this one, it was shocking to a number of people because it was so dark and, uh, and potentially um, there was just, I mean, there are a million different twists and turns in this book. 
so you don't really know the truth about everything. Uh, I mean, does any of us know the truth about anything? But I mean, you don't really know the truth about it until the very, very last pages. But the um, the the mother of the girl who becomes so embittered and starts an organization to combat dating, dating violence. Um, the mother of the uh, of the young uh, uh, convict. All of those things, all of those people were very sympathetic to me in the sense that I could picture myself as a mother in both of those situations. Don't want to be in those situations, but could picture it. Wow. Oh my God. This is so intense. I had no idea this happened from a chance encounter in a coffee line. Leecha, thank you for the fantastic question. And I bet you were not expecting to hear that answer. <laughs> Am, am I right? Oh my goodness. Um, oh wow, we have Queen Tracy Clark, award-winning thriller author, joining us from Chicago. Tracy, thank you so much for being here. It's always such an honor and a pleasure to have you. My pal. Yay! <laughs> Yay. And Tracy came on in July to give us the scoop on her book, Runner, and she's coming back in February with Faye Snowden. I can't wait to talk about all the things, Tracy. It's going to be so great to have you back, and thank you for being here tonight. I'm so honored. Uh, Sharon says, hi from Minnesota. Sharon, welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you, ma'am. Thank you. Kathy says, hello from Texas. Kathy, welcome to the conversation. Always a pleasure to have you as well. Thank you so much for joining us. All my faves are here tonight. Hooray. Oh, Anissa has a great question. She would like to know, how do you know that you have enough for a book? Do you continue researching as you're writing? Okay. So you have this crazy chance to counter and the coffee line. Then what did you do once your agent said no, but then mm -hmm. you, you, you went ahead. <laughs> and then finally said, yes, I, uh, I, I started to put together what could happen there were issues about what could happen to somebody when they come out of prison. And to me, uh, just as with my first book, The Deep End of the Ocean, it's aftermaths that are very interesting to me. Like what happens after your, your son who's been abducted, okay? What happens after he is returned to you and your whole world changes as a result? You know, you thought for that he was gone uh, forever for nine years. And now suddenly there's this kid and he's 12 years old instead of three years old. So I, uh, I wanted to deal with what the aftermath would be of someone who had committed, <coughs> who had been convicted of <clears throat> a really well publicized crime. What would it be like to try to get a job, to try to live a normal life with other kids who were you know, college age like you, what would it be like to try to fit into a community that didn't want to know you anymore and who were very sympathetic to the activism of the girl's mother and her, her activism against dating violence. So I, um, so, and then there was the whole dimension of social media. I was very interested in the idea of how would Thea, the mother of the boy, how would Stefan and how would uh, the other characters be impacted by social media? And he was indeed, he was hearing there were what he called the freaky people who wanted to flirt with him because he had been convicted of, <coughs> of murder. But there were also all kinds of anonymous critics uh, who got through uh, text messaging and on Thea's emails and, and things like that. There was uh, a concentration of ways in which um, people can get to you that they maybe couldn't have even done five years ago. Ooh, that's and such one of them, question. One of them was a woman who uh, not a, we didn't know whether it was a woman or a, a girl who said she knew something about that night that no one else knew. And so that's what started the mystery of the second part. I don't know when uh, that I necessarily have enough for a book at first. We, the woman in line at the coffee shop or, or in your book said in my book, oh, there okay. was someone who kept writing to Stefan and she kept writing to Thea and saying, I know something that no one else knows. 
Okay. Okay. Yes. I didn't know if you were saying also the woman in the coffee. No, no, no. Okay. okay. I don't know where she is now. I wish I did know. Maybe she'll read this. uh, I know know she was a reader. She was reading The Red Tent by Anita DeMont when the book I picked up. So So. clearly she likes Boston-based books. She likes Boston-based authors. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Anissa, thank you for the great question. Uh, Jacqueline, thank you so much for the great answer. Um, scrolling through, making sure I'm not missing anybody's questions. Um, oh my goodness. So many great questions. And I'm going to get to every single one of them, you guys, because these are these are so great. Okay. Let's start with, um, with Sarah White. She says she's reading this now and it is so good. Sarah, welcome back. So great to have you. Thank you. Tracy saying, hey. Hey. To your buddy there. Uh, Leecha says, thank you. She said, wow. Thank you for answering my question. No, I was not expecting this answer, but I'm so good. I asked it. Wow. This book sounds like a must read for sure. Um, and oh my goodness. Okay. Oh, Kathy says, comment. The stories that stay in your head and won't go away are stories that need to be written. Question. Were there any scenes that you shied away from writing, but eventually did? Great question. Yes, definitely. There's a scene near the end of the book in which uh, Thea has to admit uh, what she's learned from the mother of the murdered girl. It ended up being, to me, the most moving part of the book, but I did not want to write it because it would cause me to have empathy with the mother of the girl, with Jill McKenna, who I thought for a long time before I started writing the book, I thought I would just make her someone who was crazy, who had been driven crazy by grief and had taken leave of her senses and was just embittered <clears throat> to a point, to a dangerous point uh, that, um, but then w- writing this scene at the end and writing the end of the book made me understand her. And I really felt then that I couldn't, I could stand in her shoes too Mm. and not be able to deny her. And I had seen this uh, TED talk by, that was given by Sue Klebold, uh, the mother of Dylan Klebold, one of the school shooters at Columbine. And she was really blown. The audience was really blown away by her, blown back by her aghast when she said, she would not deny that she still loved her son. She still loved him dearly, Mm. the child that she had raised and she wished he was alive. Mm. And it, I guess people expected her to say, no, he was a monster. She said, well, I will always grieve and be ashamed of and feel responsible for all the things that he did, but I love him, Mm. you know, and I always love him. Mm. Oh, wow. Again, deep, deep, you know, things to talk about here. Um, Debbie would like to know, she said, I think it could clearly resonate with people due to the items in the news so often about domestic violence. The family of perpetrators also go through horrible things. And yes, the aftermath after a person has been released. Um, What draws you to this theme of aftermath, which you reckon with in each of your books? I I guess because I'm interested in what happens after the news cameras leave. I'm interested in what happens to people whose lives have been changed in some way by by violence or by uh, by some kind of other kind of natural mishap. And what happens when <clears throat> the sort of um, artificial excitement dies down and you're left with the possibility, of choosing to live a life. And it is true that when people are incarcerated, when they come out of prison, even if they've like done their time and they've been a model prisoner, that's when they're most at risk of suicide, of reoffending. Uh, they <clears throat> they can sometimes, I'm sorry, I uh, apparently there was a bone in my coffee when, that I was drinking earlier. At um, least it's not COVID. <laughs> And at this point, I hear someone coughing and I freeze. I know. I know exactly what you mean. It, it, is, it is true that I think that um, 
people are the, the the families of perpetrators are vulnerable. They want to see the second chance that they sometimes think that the people who have done their time deserve a second chance, but the second chance is often not forthcoming. We're a culture who believes in forgiveness, or we say we do, and we're a culture who believes in um, a comeback, but it doesn't necessarily play out that way in real life. That is so true. Um, because we see that um, the, the that we have extraordinarily high rates of recidivism, and we see that people who are released um, from serving their time really struggle to acclimate, to find work. Um, so that is an interesting dichotomy to hone into. Um, oh my goodness, Samantha Bailey, author of yeah. Samantha Bailey, joined the chat. She said, hello, I am such a huge, huge fan. I cannot wait to read The Good Son. Um, Samantha Bailey, thank you so much for joining us. I'm hosting Samantha in a few months about her brand new book. I can't wait. Um, and what a pleasure to have you here tonight uh, with us. Samantha, thank you. Um, oh, I see so many questions coming in. Uh, Debbie saying, it's nearly impossible per for the person to be the person released trying to get back into society. Absolutely. Um, oh, okay. Here's another good question. Alicia, Alicia would like to know, did, um, did you get to choose your book title? No. And it's the first time in my, all my years as a writer, the first time in all the books that I've written that I did not get really? to choose my book title. I had, I had gone through, 30 different titles. I had suggested titles over and over and over and over. And finally, this was a title that was suggested by somebody who was on the um, publicity team. And the the certainly the irony of it being called The Good Son is, is very appealing to me too, but it just didn't have the same. I didn't like it as much. I like it now. I didn't like it as much as some of the titles that I had come up with on my own. Well, we're going to need to know what those miracle. titles are now. Huh? We're going to need to know what those titles were. That I will tell you. Um, the, the one that we liked best, uh, my agent and I, the, originally they had in the little small town where they lived in Wisconsin, they lived on Hope Street. And the original title was The Beggars on Hope Street. And I loved that title. You know, to me, it expressed the way that things were for them, <coughs> for Thea and for Stefan when, uh, when he came back home. The other was The Mercy Gate. And I really mm -hmm. liked that title, too, because it, it spoke to both um, his wish to create a he creates a project in which people who have been convicted of crimes make some kind of restitution to mm. their victims mm. and so uh, it spoke to that and it also spoke to the idea of the prison gate i love the hope gate i love both of those but i love the hope gate because it, one thing that's you know stefan wrestles with is is he's or his mom also with Thea also wrestles with this. He, when he comes out, he he's using prison lingo lingo called you know going down the hill. The hill is referring to the prison and right. people going down the hill got out of the prison. People going up the hill go into the prison. And so I I love the idea of the hope gate because she's standing there waiting for her for her son to get dis, discharged. Um and, and um wow so they rejected all of those huh? This oh, is fascinating. Tons of them yeah. Wow, I love all of these. Misha, thanks again for the great question. Look at all these meaty answers we're getting. <laughs> we're getting thanks to these cool questions. Keep them coming, y'all. This is your time to chat with our featured author. Ask this incredible author. By the way, I just want to remind everyone that Jacqueline's very first book, The Deep End of the Ocean, was Oprah's inaugural book pick. It then became the movie starring Michelle Pfeiffer. So what an incredible opportunity to ask this author anything you want. Leisha says those are all good titles maybe for another book you would write. Would you use, would you reuse the titles? I, I don't know if it'd be appropriate. I just today 
I'm just starting another book. I mean, literally, I'll write the first words within the next week or so. And I asked the editor if she would consider leaving the title the way that I have it now. It's about an underwater photographer. And um, the title that I have now is Saltwater because saltwater isn't just her medium and her, but also it's our tears and our blood. Uh, those are all saltwater too. Oh, I and love it's it. a family story. It's about a bunch of stuff that happens in her family. So. I love that. I love that. Um, saltwater. I mean, I'm such a beach girl. I, I feel like I draw energy and faith and um, deep essential energy from the ocean. I have to live near an ocean. So I uh, saltwater is good for the soul um, and the skin. <laughs> so I'm here for it's the saltwater. It's definitely water. good for the skin. It's definitely healing. I'm afraid of, of the ocean. You are, but I'm you live near the ocean. I, I do. I live a block from the ocean and I'm afraid of it. And I'm, I don't like the sand either. Isn't that crazy? What I are know you it. afraid of? Is it drowning that no, you're scared it's of? The little, the pe the creatures that are under there. I, um, I had an experience. <laughs> I was staying at a great friend of mine's house in, it was actually in Fiji and there was sand, beautiful sand bottom all the way out <clears throat> to where there was a drop off. And I went all the way out there with my goggles and, and my snorkel and went underneath to look at the drop off. And there were these huge grouper and uh, game fish out there. And I just, you know, I would let me out of here. I was terrified of that dark water with those big uh, creatures in it. So it, you know, it is it that you're special. afraid they'll nibble on your feet or they'll they'll cut you with their teeth or what do you know what the fear is or it's just so terrifying you can't even think about it? I can't even think about it. I I have been afraid all my life of dark water. Okay, okay. You yeah. know what? Now, really you know, pool. I mean, get me to the pool and let me look at the little goldfish uh, printed on the bottom of the pool, and I'm fine with that. But not, I love to swim. It's just I'm afraid of the dark water. Oh, that's so fascinating. So you know what's really crazy, Jackie, is I hosted um, Lana Wood's book launch event in November for her tell-all story about her sister Natalie Wood's mysterious death um, at the hands of her husband. Yes. And what, what, what I learned from Lana is that Natalie had the reason that it is the, the death is so myst is so mysterious is because Natalie Wood had a lifelong paralyzing fear of dark water, only dark water, same as you, which I had actually never heard of anyone having before. And the reason she was scared of dark water was because when her mother was fleeing Russia, uh, she, she went from Siberia into China and the mother met with a fortune teller and the fortune teller said, you will have two daughters. One of them will be the most beautiful child in the world. She will become a world famous celebrated actress. Wow. She will die tragically young in dark water. And so their mother with the weight of this 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 foretelling hanging over her always kept Natalie away from dark water. And from the time that she learned to walk, said never go near water. She never taught her to swim. She My said, goodness. dark water is going to kill you. And, and then crazily, it did. It did. And it I've did. never heard of anyone being specifically, I know people who are afraid of water. I know people are afraid of drowning, but I've never known anyone who is not afraid of, who can swim, who loves to swim, but is afraid of dark water, except for you and Natalie Wood. That's so crazy. Isn't that funny? I, yes. um, ah, I'm, I'm just mesmerized by that, by learning that it, um, no, I, I could swim forever. I love nothing more than swimming where I can see the bottom, but where, <clears throat> where I can't see what is out there. And there's a, uh, a part in the book that I foresee in the book that I'm starting now when uh the the actually the woman who is the underwater photographer is afraid of water too and it when she she becomes what she becomes in part to overcome her fear and also because she becomes mesmerized by what she finds down there when she does uh go down to uh Ooh. to see yeah 
Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I I am a water baby, but I like those little creatures in there. I'm like, hey friends, what you eating? How you living down there? <laughs> um, it's so fascinating, but I'm terrified of spiders and a lot of other stuff too. Now, Only see, I like them. You like spiders? I do. I but well, they eat all the bad bugs. That's you know, true. they're not they're not insects, they're they're arachnids and you know, oh, I know. Critica was a spider, you know, Charlotte's Web. And yeah. they eat all the bad bugs. They eat all the mosquitoes. They, they're our little friends. Wow. So not afraid of spiders. Okay. We could hang out because you could take care of the spiders and I could shine the light in the dark water. <laughs> yeah. And I'm uh, even the word arachnid just sounds so terrifying. I definitely have arachnophobia. Oh my gosh. Okay. Catch a clue. Hey girl. Hey, good to have you. She's in the back room. Can you share the Oprah story with your first book? Yes. Uh, well, I think what she's referring to is that I was almost not the first uh, author, uh, Oprah Winfrey author, because whenever Oprah Winfrey would, Oprah Winfrey called me three times and left messages and I erased them because I thought <laughs> <coughs> it was someone horsing around with me. Oh my my gosh. <laughs> and finally, the last message she left, she said, you know, this really is Oprah Winfrey. And I don't know if you even live here, but if you do, could you please do me at least the courtesy of returning my phone call? And I was so, I laughed, <clears throat> but I was also horrified when she, I called her back. She said, I'm going to start the world's largest book club. And I want to start it with your book, which had been given to her by her boyfriend, Stedman, when they were on vacation. And I said, well, <clears throat> of course, that's fine with me. The publisher, however, was not as excited as I thought the publisher would be. Uh, the <laughs> publicist said, this books and Books and TV, people who watch daytime TV don't read books. I knew better than that. But they, she said, uh, don't really expect any big jump out of this. The book was already on the bestseller list. And she said, don't expect anything big to happen. Well, by the time, by the evening of the night that it was featured on the Oprah Winfrey show, it was, there were 4,000 holds on it at the New York Public Library. So, wow. Oprah was right. She's always right. I mean, Oprah's she always right. She knew, she knew, and she was <clears throat> right for me and to the 56 other authors in the first iteration of the Oprah Winfrey Book Club. She was, um, uh, she had a, a real understanding of how much people want to gossip about books. And that's what books are for. They're for gossiping about. Exactly. Yes. For dishing the hot goss about exactly. the book. What did you yes. think? You liked, you know, what did, what did you think happened? Oh, did he you wouldn't know? have done that. Who oh, he would have done that. Husband. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Thea, this. No, Belinda. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, my God. We got to right. get into it. Exactly. Exactly. And I actually started a little Facebook group for us to continue the conversation because people do want to keep talking. What are you reading? What are you liking? What do you not like about it? So, and it's, and that's where those good conversations have it. Um, and it, yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's so funny though, that you almost didn't answer because you thought, <laughs> that that I you thought, thought, yeah, was, thought it was one of my girlfriends. Oh my gosh. Well, they must have done a pretty good Oprah impression if they, if, you know, if you thought it wasn't, it, they must, you must have had some talented friends who could do good impressions. I did. I did at the time, as a matter of fact. Oh my gosh. Oh, She's clarifying that she saw you last night in the back, the back room. room. Okay, uh, so that's yeah. how much you wanted to yeah. do. Karen Dion and and Hank Phillippe Ryan do uh, a show called The Back Room. Absolutely. And speaking of Karen Dion and Hank Phillippe Ryan, um, amazing reviews from Karen Dion. So she called this book propulsive, complex, and deeply moving. The Good Son may well be charged finest work yet. I loved this book. So Karen is the bestselling author of The Marsh King's Daughter, currently just wrapping filming. She was on a couple, she was on last year uh, with us and she's absolutely wonderful. So I'm popping her review into the, her blurb into the comments. So everyone check it out because Karen is so great. Um, Lucha is saying, oh, well, saltwater sounds really good, especially what it stands for. Thank you for answering my questions. Um, 
Uh, Licha, what a pleasure to have you as always. Ooh, Debbie has a good one. She would like to know, how did you learn the lingo? I think she's referring to you to, and how did you, about the prison lingo, and how much did you research prison life or what it's like for felons upon release from prison? Um, how did you go about the research? Debbie, all great questions. Jacqueline, give us the skinny. They really are. I, I, uh, I interviewed two women uh, uh, and I don't know their names. They would only talk to me on the condition that I not really know who they are. And I spoke to them on the phone. I was put in touch with them by a mutual or a, an acquaintance that we had in common. And uh, one of them had a son who had been incarcerated and she called him a good son, but not a good boy that he had gotten in trouble and that it was almost a badge of honor in his peer group to have gone to prison. It was almost an expected thing that it was going to happen. The other woman was much more like Thea and that her son, Stefan, was a sort of middle-class kid uh, not who had never done anything wrong, never had any kind of criminal record. And it was shocking to the whole community and to the whole family that he did end up going to prison. Both of them said that their, their sons were almost terrified to come out of prison because they didn't know how they would, they wanted to come home very much, but they didn't know uh, quite simply whether anyone would ever like them again. They didn't know whether they would ever be able to, whether, <coughs> whether they would ever be able to go anywhere or do anything without people saying, look, that's him. You know, that's what he did. And and whether they would they that they would not be accepted anywhere they went. As a reporter, when I was a, a younger woman before I became a, a book writer, I had gone to prison to not gone to prison, but gone into prisons to talk to people. And I will tell you, if you have never done it, it is the most deeply unsettling thing that you can do. Why? Like, well. Because immediately when that big door closes behind you and the, there are, are layers of, I don't see how anybody ever breaks out of them. There are layers of doors, steel doors between you and the outside. You immediately feel like you're never going to get out again. And that what happens in there will, the truth of what happens inside that place will never really be known. It's a terrifying feeling. You almost feel guilty as if they're not going to let you leave. And it's, it's, it, you can, right away, the first thing that I noticed and what I tried to portray in Stefan's story is that it isn't just your freedom you lose, or even most importantly, your freedom. It's your privacy. You have no privacy. It's never really dark. There's constantly people yelling and and crying and talking to each other and fighting it's never quiet it's never really dark and you have nowhere that you can go you know we we rely on solitude and privacy even if we're the kind of person who loves other people we rely on that much more than we know and when that's deprived when you're deprived of that that I think is really one way in which you lose your dignity. Mm, wow. That is such a powerful and thought provoking um, concept because I, like many of us here tonight, I'm sure have never been in a prison. Um, I've certainly seen it on TV shows, Orange is the New Black or, mm -hmm. you know, other um, Lupin is my new favorite show. Right. Um, but there's, and it, it does look – it looks very, very scary, um, especially to a, a rule-abiding nerd like myself. <laughs> um, right. I, I want to stay out here. But um, I, I hadn't – until I read your book, I actually hadn't thought about the small things like the – I didn't know that they didn't turn off the lights at night. So that makes it – they don't even dim them. So, of course, I understand why because you can't – you have to see the – potentially right. violent, dangerous people are doing. Um, but also it would be very hard to sleep with very bright, blaring light, uh, lights in your eye. And also I hadn't thought about the fact that it wasn't quiet at night or that you would hear other people crying. I would be, 
yeah, and I thought it was interesting when you said that that they are scared to come out because I would be so scared to go in. I didn't think about the fear of coming out. And and I'm sure that for even the most evil son of a gun, it's terrifying to go in there and it's terrifying to be in there because you never know. <clears throat> you never, particularly someone who has, uh, they say there's honor among thieves, you know, and, and particularly for a, uh, in prison, they don't like people who've hurt uh, women or children. Mm. And so you're always in danger. You're going mm. to get your lunch and you don't know whether someone's going to stab you. And so you always try to walk in the back of the line mm. and you never look at people directly and never look at them in the eye or appear to challenge them. And you don't align with any particular group. You just try to keep to yourself as much as you can, uh, particularly if you're going to only be there for a short time mm. because it, because in an instant, somebody can develop a grudge against you. And what Stefan did in the book, I mean, like so many people who were more or less educated, if you will, uh, they ended up calling him the professor, as they do many prisoners who are uh, who have some education. He ended up helping people get their GEDs and working in the library and doing all these kinds of things that would keep him way out of the forefront of prison life. And I guess that's what the goal of, of somebody like him would be in there, just to try to keep as quiet and um, unknown as you possibly could. Mm, mm. A friend of mine actually used to tutor. He's incredibly <laughs> brilliant. He's a professor at Princeton and um, actually a, an astrophysicist. And, um, and he spent 10 years in the astrophysics department at Princeton searching for life on other planets. Ah. But on but in his spare time, he would teach, he would tutor math at the local women's prison in New Jersey. Um, and and the stories that he would share, you know, so for him, a, a, a male going into a female prison, it was a very interesting experience to hear how they kind of hazed him, but it was different right. because he didn't have this, you know, fear for his personal safety because he was the, the roles were reversed. Sure. Um, so it was very, very fascinating. Um, uh, so someone is watching in a private Facebook group. You guys, I'm so sorry. Facebook changed the freaking privacy rules again. Freak, hashtag freaking Facebook. And now they don't let us see your profile picture because it is, quote, a violation of your privacy. So if you want oh, to, yeah. if you want us to see your profile picture, you can, I'm just popping it in the comments. You can just click that link. You go over, you click OK once. And then forever after, we can see your profile picture. <laughs> um, this is only if you're watching in a private Facebook group, which uh, my Mystery and Thriller Mavens group, or maybe you're in Bitchy Bookworms, which are also streaming live tonight. We're streaming like seven different places. It's very exciting. Um, but it, you can just click over there. You click, yes, you can see my picture. And then for the rest of the, our, of our time together here on Facebook, I will always get to see your picture. I'm so sorry that they instituted this new privacy rule. But anyway, this person is who I can't see who it is says, I love your books. And I remember that interview with Herb Oprah. Yay. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, catch a Clue is saying thank you for sharing that story about Oprah with this group. Thank you for the great question. Um, Debbie is saying that's why I tune into these groups because I don't have family who like to read and discuss books. Um, Debbie, thanks for being here. And you're you're our family. You're our book family. You're our books to family. So you're among friends. And, uh, and we love to chat about books. So I'm glad that you are here among us. Um, we love to – I always love to have you and see your name. So thank you. Um, someone else is saying, I can't wait to read it. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank I want to remind you, you guys that this book just came out six days ago. Someone else is saying, hello. Um, I want to remind you guys, this book just came out six days ago and you can grab your copy right now tonight from the woman owned murder by the book. You can grab it tonight and support a wonderful independent woman owned bookstore. Um, so I'm just plopping, I'm popping the comments, uh, the link into the comments. Um, Debbie saying, but Jacqueline, many people from form alliances on the inside in order to stay alive. There are gangs, groups, and cliques. Jacqueline, your response That's, to that. She's absolutely right. And many people do form those alliances and feel enormous pressure to form them 
but there are also people who like Stefan was who call themselves indies mm -hmm. and they don't uh associate with um you know with the the people who are the weightlifters or the people who are um who are involved with any particular sort of politic they just sort of it let it be known that they have no grudge against anybody mm. and they don't want to affiliate with anybody they just want to be left alone unless you need some help with something like they're switzerland and, <laughs> yes they're switzerland they're neutral exactly that's so smart they're like neutral nations and uh and some and Many times people, you know, the that's what uh, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption was about. Mm. Um, he was uh, an indie and he just all he did was try to get books from the library. Of course, he had his plan that was going on, too. But nobody really. <clears throat> Stefan was beaten up a number of times in the book. You'll, you find out that he comes to the visiting room and he has a, his arm in a sling and he has bruises on his face. He's beaten up in, in a number of different times and places, but um, my thing just decided to fall apart there uh, that, um, but if you just, people tell me that the most important thing is just to keep your head down and not challenge anybody. Yeah. Because if you, Prison is an extraordinarily macho society. Yeah. A woman's prison and a woman's prison. And if you challenge someone, <clears throat> basically that person is honor bound to, to get down with you, to fight with you. Yikes. Yeah. That's really scary. Um, Debbie, thank you for the great comment. And Nisa is saying, thank you, ladies. This is lots of information. Yes, this is lots of interesting information. Thank you, Anissa. And thank you, Jacqueline, for this. Um, I want to remind everyone, the link is in the comments. So click over, grab your copy of The Good Son now. Um, Y'all, we are out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining us. And Jacqueline, I just, you know, I'm popping some, uh, popping some other amazing reviews from Kristen Hanna, Christina Baker, Klein, Scott Turo, Lisa Genova, Jean Quack, Karen Slaughter. Oh my goodness. This book is just being lauded by everyone. So um, I'm, I'm going to put those in the, in the, in the comments thank for you. anyone. Um, and Jacqueline, what do you want people to leave the, the, I think books ultimately are a chance to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, to see life through someone else's eyes, a life we'll never, may never know. What do you want people to leave your pages feeling, learning, having experienced any parting words? This particular book, the most important takeaway from it, I think ultimately is the almost astonishing persistence mm. of love, of love, mm. of a, the particularly the love of a mother for a child, but the persistence, no matter what love may drive us to do that's wrong, the love itself is never wrong. And oh. it, um, and it, it lasts in the most amazing ways and persists almost against all reason. Oh, oh my gosh. I love that. I love, I love that. Um, the stubborn persistence of love is such a powerful thing because I think the reason, I mean, this is so such an unimaginably painful thing to imagine the person, one of the pers people you love the most mm -hmm. doing something that is unconscionable to you, unacceptable to you, horrifying, shocking. Um, and how do you reckon with that? Um, and, and I love that the stubborn, you know, insistence on love. Um, Sarah White saying, thank you, Ladies, Sarah, thank you so thank much you for so joining much. us. Um, I'm making sure I don't miss anybody's comments. Oh my gosh, Anissa, thank you so much. Lisa, Leach is saying thank you. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Grab your copy of the book. Um, and I will see you next Monday for hashtag Mystery Monday because you know Mondays can be murder. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs>